Hi, uh, welcome to the New Voting Project. My name is Kanal, your host. Um, and today we are honored to have Professor Robert Polin on our show. Um, nothing I say can really introduce you um, in your full might and glory, but you've had an incredible career on, on political discourse, economics, political economy. Um, but on a very high level, I'm just gonna kind of focus on some key things that you've done um, in, in various capacities. You're a distinguished professor of economics um, at um, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, you're the co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute um, there. You're also the founder and president of PEAR, um, which is focusing on green energy. It's a green energy company um, operating throughout the United States. You have authored several publications advocating for, for green economies on every level and green economic development. You've worked with US NGOs on, on creating living wages um, at both municipal and state levels um, and financial regulatory policies and also authored multiple publications regarding single payer healthcare and the economics behind it. Uh, so that's just a brief introduction. I hope I did it some justice. Oh, that's more than enough. Thank you very much. <laughs> of course. Uh, it's really great to have you. Uh, I know I understand you could be super busy, you know, teaching the minds of America, or something like that. Uh, but, but let's dive into the show. Sure. All right. So just for our viewers, uh, talk a little bit about your background. Uh, touch on how any education you've had throughout the course of your career has kind of prepared you for the roles and capacities you encompass today? Well, I don't know how far back you really want to go, <laughs> um, but uh, just to, my adult background, um, I went to college uh, in the, uh, at the end of the 1960s and the early 70s. So it was a period of very high political and economic upheaval and organizing. I was in a college, I was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, which is, was one of the most active campuses in terms of organizing against the Vietnam War. So I was involved in that around civil rights uh, for African-Americans. So that was kind of the milieu in which I started becoming a grown up. Uh, and I, I definitely took to that, I was part of that movement and what I was really saw uh, through my college experience was the importance of trying to combine um, one's political or even let's say ethical commitments with, with uh, trying to understand the world. You know, Karl Marx said, um, you know, philosophers of all sorts have uh, tried to understand the world. The point, however, is to change it. And I would disagree a little bit with uh, Carl here in that I think understanding the world is equally important to trying to change it. If, if you don't understand it well, and if you're and not- you can't change it. it. Right. Yeah. And so I think we need to have humility about trying to understand the world, which means you need to work pretty hard to try to grasp a meaningful understanding. So that's kind of how I flowed into uh, doing economics and going for a PhD and then committing myself to that as a you know, profession over the last 40 years or so. So uh, I've kind of haven't changed my perspective all that much from way back when I was you know, in my 20s mm -hmm. uh, in terms of both trying to understand the world and trying to change it. And that's really, you know, I think it, when you see that you, that you were nice to mention all those various things I've written, but, you know, they're both, they're all really efforts to both change the world and understand the world and to do and to change the world for the better, of course. Right. And let me be the first to tell you, you don't look a day over 20. I don't so, look a day over 20, but I'm actually 70. No, really? Mm, wow, you yeah. look really good for 70. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Well, I am, whether I look good or not. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm glad. And of course, you've had a, an astonishing career um, and, and all the research you've done, I think, is, is preparing the new generation, I guess, us uh, right. in the future. So thank you for that. Um, but let's kind of move in to, to the research that you've done. Um, what are some of the, the core po policies 
and, and objectives that, that you've been trying to focus on throughout your career. And following that, why did you decide on, on becoming an educator as an outlet of expressing your thought? Well, uh, first of all, I decided to uh, study economics. Mm -hmm. um, even though that was not my major in college, my major in college was history, which I liked a lot. But um, I felt like economics was um, a set of tools that would enable me to engage with present day debates, policy issues, changing the world in a more direct way. And I still think that was a good decision. Um, so uh, when I went into graduate school and did economics, I also, um, the area that I first did my serious research, well, I had a job and I was working in, in the area of energy way back when, because that was the time of the so-called oil shocks of uh, 19, in the 1970s under OPEC, the Organization of, uh, uh, Organization of Petroleum exporting countries. Uh, so what would be the impact on economics of these huge increases in oil prices? And that uh, led me into the area of energy economics, nothing to do with climate change at all. It was about which who would get the benefit of developing fossil fuel energy. That was uh, a first, that was a project that I was doing while I was in grad school. And then in terms of uh, my doctoral dissertation, I really wanted to understand um, how financial markets work and how they uh, work to oppress people and how they can, how we can reconceptualize the operations of financial markets, Wall Street, let's say, mm -hmm. to uh, serve people better. So that was really my first um, focus in terms of research. And, and then I generally, then I broadened out into other areas uh, like employment, understanding employment, how you get to a full employment economy, how you sustain it, how you do this, is this compatible with capitalism? Mm -hmm. Talking about Karl Marx again, Marx made clear that mass unemployment was, was fundamental to the operations of capitalism. In other words, if you if you had a full employment economy, workers would have too much power and uh, they, you know, the capitalists couldn't make any profits. So that would be the end of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So uh, that kind of creates a challenge. <laughs> yeah, either if you want everyone to have decent employment, uh, at least, then can you do it within capitalism? So that becomes a big question. Um, I then got um, active I was actually recruited. I used to teach in California, actually, at University of California, Riverside. Right. And I got recruited into doing work on uh, living wages by activists in LA who were organizing around that. So that kind of uh, coincided with my work on employment issues. How do you create decent work, living wage work, where everybody at least can you know, earn enough to sustain themselves and a family and not be suffering. Uh, so that was the next area I got into. Um, and then I also got recruited into working on single payer healthcare, again, by California, by the California Nurses Association. CNA. CNA. Yeah. Uh, and I was very close to the, the president at the time, uh, Roseanne DeMauro, who was a great labor leader. So she got me working on this. I really didn't have any background in it at all, in particular. Um, and meanwhile, I also, the issue of the, you know, climate change is emerging ever more forcefully in doing macroeconomics, like the understanding the economy as a whole in a big picture. Um, you can't really do it anymore unless you integrate climate issues. Right. And so that's really how I got started thinking about climate change and uh, the green economy. So that kind of ties it all together. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a nice evolution yeah. of, of research. Uh, but I wanna, I wanna start off with, with single payer healthcare. Yeah. Obviously we are in a global pandemic. You know, we thought we were punching back. Um, there, were, there have been attacks on, on, on the ACA, Obamacare um, during this time. What are your 
what were your initial thoughts on single payer healthcare? What are they now? Is, is it actually possible? You know, the, the question everybody asks is, can we afford it? Um, and, and, and the economics behind it. So again, you know, I was not, I was of course interested mm -hmm. in this issue, but it really wasn't an area of specialty at all for me mm -hmm. uh, until Roseanne DeMauro of the California Nurses Association and National Nurses United basically said, look, we'd like you to study this and tell us how we can make this work in California. It was before I did a national study. So my first foray was precisely for California. And, you know, I just told her, uh, I'm not an expert, you know, uh, you really want me to do it? She said, yeah. Uh, because she knew my orientation politically, frankly, and you know, <laughs> my pro-worker position. So uh, I did it. And then uh, from there, I got recruited to do a national study by Bernie Sanders. <coughs> so here is my conclusion your, to your question, can we afford single payer? In fact, single payer is a whole lot less expensive than our existing healthcare system. Mm -hmm. uh, our existing healthcare system is by far the most expensive in the world. Mm -hmm. We compare what we spend, which is about 18% of the whole economy goes to healthcare. You know, if we compare other countries, Canada, Germany, France, you know, United Kingdom, they're spending between seven and 9% of their overall economy. Uh, this is massively different, you know, because we have a $21 trillion economy. So between, let's say, a 9% and an 18% level of expenditure, you know what we're talking about. You know, we're, we're talking about trillions of dollars, right? We're talking about $2 trillion, right. uh, uh, a, a difference here, uh, $2 trillion. This is not peanuts. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, but the, then the question is, can can the U.S. more or less replicate what has been done in other countries? Um, and the answer is, of course, we can. What's holding it back is the politics, because if we're spending two trillion dollars more than is necessary mm -hmm. to deliver healthcare. Um, Somebody's getting that $2 trillion. And who's getting the $2 trillion are the pharmaceutical companies, the drug companies, the hospitals, and the high end of the medical profession. That's who's getting it. And of course, they don't want to give it up. Um, on the other hand, we're spending twice as much as these other countries, and we're getting inferior outcomes. If you look at standard measures, such as you know, avoidable deaths, uh, the U.S. ranks like 35th in the world. Mm. We're not even close to being a good uh, 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 performer in terms of healthcare outcomes. So we're people are suffering because you know of the greed of these huge companies that are making tons of money off of healthcare. So uh, the then the next question is well, is there some practical way, okay, we already have the system in place that we have, mm -hmm. is there a practical way to transition uh, into something akin to a system like other countries have, uh, where we don't have private health insurance, where we have regulations as to uh, capping out pharmaceutical uh, prices and so forth? And my answer again is yes, we can. Uh, of course, it's a challenge. It's mainly a challenge politically because of the opposition. But, you know, as it is, about 40% of all payments in our existing healthcare system run through the government. They run through Medicare, Medicaid, and other programs within the government, such as for the Defense Department. So in terms of the logistics of transitioning to a single payer, a government payer system, we're already 40% of the way there. Now, what about the other 60%? Well, the other 60%, most of it 
is um, people covered by their employer, private right, health private, insurance. Private insurance, right. right. Yeah. Now, the private employers, they don't have any stake in a private health insurance system. In fact, they would be better off to, they would save money. I mean, one of the calculations that we made, let's say you switched from the private health insurance dominated system today to single payer health tomorrow. Uh, the private companies would save, I don't know, they'd save on average a calculation I made, on average close to a million dollars a year because they wouldn't have to pay out so much. They're paying for the health insurance for their employees. So it would, if a system saves money, it saves money across the board. Uh, so that, you know, and if we have such a consolidated private health insurance system, so the, pri the private companies pay into private health insurance insurers, they can just as easily flip the switch and make payments to the government run system. So the, the fact of the matter is it really wouldn't be that difficult to switch to single payer. When we created the uh, Medicare system, which is single payer for people over 65, right. old people like me, um, <laughs> uh, we did it in 1965 in less than one year. And that was before we had all the advantages of modern information technology. Things were done on typewriters, mail, but nevertheless, we were, we were able to bring uh, tens of millions of people into the Medicare system in less than one year. So along all dimensions, moving to a single payer system, in my view, right. is eminently feasible. It's desirable. It saves money for people. It saves money for companies. It will deliver better health care. Right. And I wonder why we haven't gotten there yet. Right. Well, well because, the, as I said, that $2 trillion increment that is sitting there, you know, they, yes, the private, basically the private insurance companies would be out of business. They don't want to go out of business. <laughs> they like being in business. Yeah, uh, I believe it. Pharmaceutical companies, drug companies in the US charge on average twice as much for the same or similar uh, medications than is done, let's say, in Canada and, and Western Europe. They like that. They like the extra profits. They don't want to get rid of that. So they're going to fight it. And they have a lot of political clout. And that's the main thing keeping us back. Right. And I think that always comes back to something I look at when, when I enter campaigns, right, is, is who's funding, right? Who, who's the money behind the operation? Um, are they clean money candidates or is a super PAC or, um, you know, real estate or fossil fuel? Who is actually funding? I was recently on a campaign where um, my candidate, the social justice advocate, was uh, campaigning for a $22 minimum wage, even above the, the $15 we're trying to pass federally. And as soon as corporations like McDonald's and Uber heard about this, um, they poured $25,000 into the opponent, the establishment, because, you know, like they said, they like their profits, they like their margins, um, and, and they'd rather keep them than, than ensure um, more coverage for, for all people. Um, so, so no, I, I definitely understand. We, we on the advocacy side kind of just want to get it done, but it's always, it's always helpful and insightful when, when somebody can explain kind of the, the the numbers behind behind our thoughts yeah. so, so thank you um now let's talk about the green new deal sure. um obviously you know it, it's one of bernie sanders aoc the the squad's most most acclaimed kind of legislation they've proposed um and and trying to build green economies as the future right it's something that i've advocated for at very local levels to candidates um, at the county and municipal level, because I really think it can start with the community um, who's willing to, to make that transformation. What are your thoughts? Like we said, political, politically we're gridlocked, but how beneficial is it for, for, for smaller communities where I live and even larger urban 
uh, cities to, to transition to green economies? I think it's really critical. Uh, I think that, as you said, at the federal government level, I mean, I, I, I'm gonna give Biden credit. He is trying to do things and there is a bill now before Congress that Bernie Sanders is championing right. that uh, would make significant progress in terms of financing investments in solar energy, wind energy, energy efficiency, electric vehicles, public transportation, all of those things that are critical for reducing uh, CO2 emissions and stabilizing the climate. All that is fine, that's great. But it's, you know, even with the bill that Bernie is uh, supporting, it's not enough, it's not close to enough. So what, uh, what is done at the level of communities and institutions is really critical. Mm -hmm. uh, take, for example, my own institution, University of Massachusetts. Um, we're committed to uh, becoming a zero emissions institution within, I don't know what the final date we set on, but somewhere within 10 years. And, you know, we're just one example. Um, let's say all big universities did that. Let's say all municipalities did that. Mm -hmm. Well, and they actually wouldn't have to spend any money. Uh, all they would be doing is creating a market for clean energy, for renewable energy and high efficiency. And then it would be up to other people, such as myself, as you said, I have this small business, right. to create the supply and supply it to UMass. Or what town do you live in? Uh, Dublin. Okay. Dublin, California votes that we're going to be 100% clean energy, zero emissions. Right. You can get there, but you have to, the way you do it is you have to stop buying fossil fuel energy and start buying clean energy. Right. And again, right now, uh, you can buy clean energy. It's cheaper than fossil fuel energy. So the town would not lose any money. You do have to make the commitment. There's work to be done. But what is done in the level of the local communities, what's done at colleges, what's done at churches, synagogues, all of that is hugely important, both in spreading the word, creating momentum, and then also shifting the market. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, nobody's, if, if nobody wants to buy uh, oil, coal, and natural gas, then it doesn't really matter what the policies are at the federal government. If nobody's going to buy it, nobody's going to buy it. If everybody says, oh, no, 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 no. We want our utility to su supply electricity with solar energy or solar and wind or solar, wind, and geothermal. Well, then that's what's going to happen. All right. I don't think pg and &E would like that very much. <laughs> well, okay. Um, but they can just as easily uh, start buying solar. I mean- right. I myself, uh, looking out my backyard, I have solar panels uh, out there in my yard, and I sell it to our local utility in the summer when I have an excess. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and then the rest of the year when it's winter here, we don't have, you know, we have fairly harsh winters, then I have to buy it back. Right. And they can be supplying that with wind energy, they can be supplying it with solar energy. Uh, they can still make money. I mean, I don't think they should make as much money as they do, but we can debate that. But the point is, they can still make money on the foundation of renewable energy. Uh, and the people that won't make any money are obviously the people that are entirely dependent on selling oil, coal, and natural gas, because we have to stop consuming that. Right. One thing that we always say about the Green New Deal at any level um, is that it's a jobs program. We are trying to stimulate economic activity within communities. Um, what, specifically, when we, when we look at solar um, and other renewable energy, we say, let's do it on infill. You know, let's do it on infill. Let's not get rid of open space. Let's put it on existing apartment complexes or houses, or let's retrofit them. Let's bring them up to modern, modern standards, right? So that way, like you said, we can supply when an access, I live in a in a fairly hot state these days due to climate change. 
um yeah right supply it back to pg and e um but yeah no i i honestly believe if if each community looked at like you said the long-term implications of climate change or if some of them at least recognized its existence uh i'm in a recall election right now so i gotta deal with some stuff about that um i think we we, we would have a brighter future or at least one that's not you know orange crimson skies in california uh, well, the thing that I, I initially got into the issues around climate change was exactly on the issue of jobs. Right. Because, uh, and this was already, you know, like 15 years ago, but the uh, framing of the discussion then almost totally and to a large extent still now, less so, uh, is that, okay, if you want to move towards reducing emissions and stabilizing the climate, fine. We can do that, but you're going to sacrifice jobs. It's going to be a huge source of job loss and uh, lower living standards for working people. Right. Certainly, Donald Trump feasted on exactly this idea. And now that idea was the thing I challenged in my initial work on this question um, because it never made any sense to me because I thought of this as transitioning to a green economy is a form of an industrial policy. Mm -hmm. Now, when we think about, let's say the military, whatever one might think about what the military does, uh, we always hear, well, look, spending on the military is good for jobs. It's gonna create a lot of jobs in Dublin, Amherst, Massachusetts, wherever you have some kind of defense department operation, that's jobs. True, uh, but you can say the same thing about, let's say we're gonna have a civilian conservation corps. We're right. gonna be building out the green economy. We're gonna be uh, creating high efficiency buildings. We're gonna be having, uh, we're gonna be creating these um, electric vehicle charging stations. All of those are jobs. And so a lot of my initial work was trying to calculate exactly how many jobs. And what I ended up showing was that you get roughly three times more jobs for a given amount of spending, given dollars, than if you sustain our existing fossil fuel infrastructure. Wow, three times as many jobs. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big number. Yeah. In the fossil fuel industry, for sure. Um, yeah. Well, to anybody out there listening, <laughs> Green New Deal, um, when are you going to run for, for office? Then you can vote for the Green New Deal. Uh, um, well, I don't think I'm going to run. I think you should run and, you know, hire me <laughs> as your advisor. Oh, OK. All right. We'll talk about that afterwards. <laughs> um, let's move into my favorite segment of the show. Where, where we talk about voting rights. It is the, the premise. Um, obviously, it's a very um, trendy and, and almost crazy uh, topic right now in the United States. Um, what were your thoughts on the 2020 election? Crazy year, you know, pandemic and huge presidential election and a bunch of down ballot initiatives in every state. Um, what are some of the lessons you learned from, from last year? Well, the first lesson is that we really, uh, I, this may trivialize it if I say, well, we really dodged a bullet. Uh, in my view, uh, Donald Trump represented some form of fascism uh, for the country. Uh, he certainly had has no intention of respecting uh, democratic processes. He came very close to getting reelected. Uh, even, even though he lost the election, he came reasonably close to overturning the outcome of the election. Right. And had he succeeded, you know, uh, and, you know, taken over the Justice Department uh, and, you know, advanced these voting restriction measures that are ongoing anyway, who knows? I mean, we would be something like, other countries that nominally have elections, but the elections don't really matter 
because the people in power have a lock on everything and they control the military. And, you know, this may sound far-fetched. It would have sounded far-fetched to me two or three years ago even, but seeing the outrageous uh, kinds of initiatives undertaken by Trump and the level of support he nevertheless still got, 75 million people voted for him. Right, yeah. Uh, and I am pretty convinced that had it not been for COVID, he would have been reelected because the unemployment rate would have been low and the stock market would have been up. Uh, so, you know, having, uh, there's a lot of things that are wrong with our democracy. The, you know, the level of actually of democratic control is uh, not, is, is limited as we've already talked about the power of big business and the imperative of profits for big business has uh, heavy control over everything we do. Nevertheless, we do still have, we do still have a lot of room for democratic engagement such as the work you're doing and a lot of other people like you. And we have to defend that and expand it and fight for it because it's really easy to have it go away. And the kinds of measures that you just briefly referred to that are going on in Texas, Georgia and so forth, mm -hmm. aiming to restrict voting rights, that's the point. The, the, the point is they wanna prevent people from voting so that they can control what goes on right. and, and put president. in people like Trump. Yeah. Uh, maybe not as outrageous personally as Trump, uh, but uh, maybe as outrageous. But the point is, in any case, there is a serious fascist movement mm -hmm. uh, in this country as evidenced by the January 6th invasion of the Capitol. And, uh, you know, those people really think that um, they were ready to, you know, as they said, they wanted to even string up Mike Pence hang him for not supporting this fascist Donald Trump. So what you're doing in terms of really building support for voting rights and defending it and making it substantive, absolutely critical. Yeah, yeah. And I was, you know, I was gonna add when after the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol, um, I thought, you know, I, I've studied history probably not as much as you have, uh, but I've studied history throughout my um, my academics and, and really focused on it. I thought it was the end of the American experiment. I thought we were going to go into civil war after that point because uh, it, it just matched. So it was such a nice parallel. Um, yeah, but no, the, the Trump administration. It's not many words I can use to explain what happened there. You know, the Trump the people were horrible, yeah. but. Yeah. They could have been even more horrible. Exactly. I mean, if we take, for example, um, oh, now, what was his name again? Uh, the the, the um, attorney general. Um, oh, oh, crap. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was completely obsequious to Trump. Right. On everything. And then, and then all of a sudden he said, really, I can't go quite this far. We can't overturn the election. Um, similarly with the Supreme Court. I mean, Trump had three picks. They all were are extreme right wingers oh, yeah. in terms of their background. But even they said, no, we can't overturn the election. Right. But they can't now, overturn the They Roe could have gone slightly differently. Had they gone slightly differently, they would be the end of uh, US democracy. Yeah, yeah, but right now I think they're they're focusing on overturning Roe v. Wade. Um, yeah. So there, there's a, there's the pros and cons of even that. Um, but yeah, no, 2020 was a um, unprecedented year, I think. Yeah. Puts yeah. it well. Um, now I'm gonna ask you a very simple question. It's really there's only one answer, but who knows? Um, at this point, is voting important? Absolutely. What's, what else do we have in terms of, uh, you know, the bedrock tools for trying to fashion a, a decent society, a fair society, a society where people all have opportunities, where people are treated equally? Of course, we're very, very, very far from such a society. 
but if we don't, don't have strong vote, voting rights, we would go backwards very, very quickly. I mean, again, there's a lot wrong with US democracy now. There's a lot of things about which I would object even with the, you know, under Biden, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a far cry better than what we, where we would be uh, had Trump managed to succeed in his machinations. And so we have to defend voting and we have to strengthen voting rights and we have to expand laws that will enable people to vote easily, express their will easily. And we have to limit the role of big money in politics because you know this, the principle of our democratic system is one person, one vote. Everybody is supposed to have equal influence in determining political outcomes. Obviously that's not true. But you, you know the magnitude of the power of big money uh, undergirded by big corporations to get what they want in the political system, uh, that needs to be defeated. Uh, at least we have to fight it. It's not easy. The odds are not good. But that's without having strong voting rights, basically, big money, big corporations, and fascists would take over entirely. They almost did. Yeah, we came very close um, to, to that um, kind of surreal, um, even at this point. Um, yeah, no, voting is important, folks. <laughs> Go out there, get registered. I will be voting in my first election next year. Uh, oh. Pre-registered, I will be 18. Going to vote in the primaries and the general. We got some big elections here in California with redistricting coming up, but I wanted to ask you, should young folks, 17, 16 year olds also be given that, you know, voting right, be that one person, one vote, one idea, should they be directing control over at least their, their school board policies or even their municipal governments, folks who are deciding their budgets, I mean, do you think that's a, a progressive idea folks should shift towards? Yes. Uh, I mean, if we look at the extent to which progress has been made on the single most critical issue of our time, which in my view is climate change. Right. Uh, who's really mobilized action? Who's really forced politicians to take serious stands? It's really young people, starting with Greta Thunberg, this little young, whatever she was, 15 year old in Sweden right. on her own. And then she got, you know, she started a whole global movement. And it's really that, that and, and the, the fact of young people shaming old people for talking big and accomplishing very little, uh, that is what has at least established some hope in terms of making progress around climate change. And I think in general, uh, you know, uh, obviously there's some point at which people are too young to be able to understand issues. I don't, I don't know what that cutoff is, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly when you're 16, 17, like yourself, uh, look at yourself. I mean, you obviously have been able to really get engaged before right. you're even able to vote. And I think that if young people are given that responsibility, uh, then they would be able to also start thinking in way, I mean, they're not all gonna be as engaged as you, of course, but I think that it's, uh, I mean, again, look at the example of what tens of millions of young people accomplished around the issue of climate change. You know, people like me have been working on it for, over a decade, I think we've made some progress, but it took the young people, took Greta, and then Greta turning on young people all over the world yeah. to, to, take, to take the right moves. Yeah, let me tell you, um, way back when I was a freshman in high school, seems like so long ago for me. I feel so old, <laughs> um, but I was listening, I was in a car ride, um, 
was not electric so don't don't shoot me i'm not that purist uh, but i was listening to npr on the radio and bill mckibben was was there he's the founder um, 350. yeah 350 and he was talking about you know his work with climate change and and you know the journalists were like wow you've sent, you've done such a great job mobilizing young people I was like, what is 350? It's 350, like what is this number that they're talking about, 350.org? And that was my first kind of entrance into politics is I joined 350 as a member, I became active in their youth group. And then 350 led me to Sunrise, which is a big you know, youth movement for climate change. And then Sunrise led me to political campaigns because they're an advocacy group. And now I'm all the way here. Um, and so if, if I were to go, think back and say, what got me here, it'd have to be climate change. It would have to be 350. Well, that makes sense because it's yeah. your world. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to be a, inherit a world where, you know, you have fires now, you have smoke in the air now. What if it's, you know, 80% worse in right. five years? It's going to be unlivable. California will become unlivable for a lot of the year. Yeah. And right. so. Um, the Sunrise Movement, again, like Greta throughout the world, but it was really the Green New Deal really got put on the political map by the Sunrise Movement sitting in a Nancy Pelosi's office. Right. Yeah, AOC went along with them, but she wasn't the one who came up with the idea. It was the Sunrise Movement. Sunrise Movement, actually, the leaders of it started right here in UMass. Wow. So I'm very proud of that. And they've done fantastic things. Uh, now, I don't want to say that you know, older people, middle-aged people, old people aren't doing things. They are, uh, we are, but it's really the uh, young people who have given new energy, new life, new perspective mm -hmm. around this issue and other issues. And that yes, therefore you deserve the right to vote. Yeah, no, I believe it. And um, I guess in closing, I want I want to ask, what is your advice to to the next generation, to Gen Z? Uh, I don't know where they got Z from. If you ask me that, totally clueless on that. But how how can we make an impact on voting, elections, I guess the economy? You know, yeah, <laughs> economists, and or just you know for the folks who feel exhausted, alienated, um, how do we encourage them to stay engaged and not you know, move aside and, and become ignorant to, to policies that are affecting them? You know, the types of things you're describing are all the life opportunities out there for you. I mean, you are just in the early stages emerging into being adults. What kind of world do you want to inherit? Um, the kind of world that you want to inherit is going to depend on what you guys decide to do with yourselves. And, you know, people are going to make all kinds of decisions. And I respect all kinds of uh, people's decisions in life like you. I can hardly say I myself am a purist with respect to climate or any of the other issues. Um, I've had a lot of zigs and zags. I have close friends that have different perspectives than me. I have relatives that have different perspectives than me. And that's the world. But uh, you know, having some basic ethical foundations um, in terms of uh, basic rights of people, voting rights, uh, in terms of people having jobs and earning a decent income of jobs, uh, people having access to health care as a human right, of people having an environment that isn't being destroyed. I think, you know, no matter what else you may want to do with your life, uh, these are things to embrace and to fight for. And even if everybody is not going to be as committed and active as you, and I'm sure they're not, they still can be engaged to some degree that they feel comfortable with uh, and support the efforts of people like you that are clearly going to be taking leadership roles in the coming decades. Yeah. Well said. Um, no, you know, I, I have to agree. It's 
I think voting is it, it's not it's not the silver bullet, but it's definitely the start. It, it's, oh yeah, it's where you have to begin. You know, every every chapter has the first page. That's the first page. Um, but no, yeah, no. Thank you, thank you so much for 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 doing this interview. Um, it's been very informative, and and I think your perspective. Um, I, it sheds a light on, on a lot of the prominent issues that we'll be facing. Great. So, so thank you. For great that. talking to you. And yeah. Keep up the keep up the great work. Of course, and you're always welcome back on the show anytime. Sure. Yeah. Just get in touch. Exactly. Um, so no, thank you, and and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Bye.